I understand that there's some of you who weren't able to come last week, so for uh, the benefit of those who are here for their first evening, we'll just have a quick run through of what this is. It's a program which is partly lecture and partly workbook. The lecture part deals with theory and the workbook puts the theory into practice in our make-believe imaginary deals. Now last week, I believe, in your books, you got the um, two fact situations and two agreements of purchase and sale and a variety of other forms and uh, precedents which we looked at briefly during the lecture and we'll concentrate on some of them a little more later on this evening. We have some added facts as we got working with the documents we realized that we needed some more facts. You'll be getting your material in bits and pieces week by week. We'll try and keep you about a week ahead so that you'll have the workbook material for the following week. Those of you who want to take a stab at filling it in on your own, fine. Otherwise, we'll try and do it during the lectures. We will also try and start at 5.30 and try and finish at 7.30. At 6.30, we'll stand up, change speakers, and get back to it. There is uh, uh, an extra handout this evening. Would you make sure that you got three lectures and three sketches. You should have a long sketch by Spates and a short one, which is another variety of the same, and you should have a short one prepared by Holding and Jones. We're going to be working on those this evening. We owe a great debt of thanks to the Continuing Education Department. They have been most kind and courteous in helping us try and get our stuff together and get it out to you on the right night. And I'd like to thank Ruth Windler and tonight Nancy Salzman. And I'd be most grateful if you could do all the putting in your book that you'd like now. It's terribly distracting up here when they're trying to speak to hear the background. So if you'd like to open and close and do all that kind of stuff now. Don't despair, the table of contents is coming, but the contents are still being put together. Those of you who were here last week met some of our instructors. You will note, by the time we are through, the diversity of background of our instructors. Last week we had Brian Bucknell, who is the holder of several degrees and who has taught at uh, U of T and at Osgoode and who has wide practical experience. You also heard Ian White, who is a small, uh, at least practices in a small firm, and who is very active with the County of York, especially on the subject of tariff, which was one of the topics that he was dealing with. This evening, we have a practitioner from a medium-sized firm just outside Toronto in the person of Brenda Duncan, who's a partner with the Lawrence firm in Brampton and has been there since her call to the bar in 1974, following her law school, law school ing at Windsor. The emphasis in Brenda's practice is real property. The kind of thing that she is speaking about tonight, you will notice she is speaking from the heart as well as from experience. Great deal of real estate experience and particularly uh, showing her concern for the practice in real estate by her participation in the real property section of the Canadian Bar, uh, formerly as secretary, currently as vice senior official, chairman, chairperson. I'm uh, the most anxious to hear what we're going to hear from Brenda Duncan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Miriam. I don't think it's going to be any secret what I'm going to talk about tonight because I've already had it all printed up and most of you have it in, in front of you. But apparently it's a no-no. I shouldn't say apparently because I feel this way myself when I attend lectures. It's a no-no to read from your notes when you know, people have got the printed notes in front of them. So I'm going to do everything in my power to keep from doing that. But Miriam says I have to go for quite a bit of time, so I might resort to that in the end. I've taken my 24 pages of written notes and summarized them into three and a half pages of my handwritten scrawl. So that gives you some idea as to the amount of time that I'm going to devote to the 
actual written notes. I think tonight my main emphasis is going to be on the workbook section of our, uh, of our binder, I guess. And I'm going to be basically uh, trying to tie in the uh, workbook uh, with my lecture, uh, and in particular, uh, starting at, um, I believe it's page 22, and moving forward to page 2 and including, I believe, page 30. And uh, so, looking then to my lecture, first thing, of course, is the, the role of the real estate agent. Basically, what I'm covering off here, and I might just take a moment just to briefly run through it, I'm going to talk about the role of the real estate agent and where he comes into the picture and what he should be doing and what we should be letting him do. Um, costs, and that's when I flip to the workbook because costs and adjustments, uh, you'll see that you know, there's a goodly number of things that I can say about that and I intend to do that. Uh, financing, that's always of great importance and I have a number of uh, subheadings which again a lot of those things will tie in uh, with the, uh, the figure of the costs. And uh, some practical pointers and I'll get into a little bit about HUDAC and home inspections and closing dates and so on. And the last and I think most important, quite frankly, is communications. And that's the communications, you know, from the, from the solicitor going out to the client and of course reverse the client coming back to the solicitor and communications within the solicitor's firm. And this is when I get into this uh, memorandum to conveyancers and that kind of thing. Okay, the real estate agent, well of course we've got to start off with him because he's basically on the scene before we are. Uh, the purchaser, of course, is interested in buying a house and uh, he generally drop, drops into a real estate agent's office and says, you know, this is the kind of thing I want, take me around. And the real estate agent usually gets involved with preparing the offer and many times, of course, he's talked the client into signing the offer uh, on the strength of his preparing it without the client having had the benefit of taking it to his lawyer and of course we all know what, that hap what happens then. The client comes in with a fait accompli and he hands it to us and says, well, you know, what did I, what did I sign? You know, what am I in for? And that's when we kind of tell him all of the terrible things that are going to happen to him and at the end of which he then sort of says, well, get me out of it. You're the lawyer. You're supposed to fix it for me. And it's kind of, I kind of feel hopeless and helpless a lot of the times and I sort of shrug my shoulders and said, well, you know, what, I, what am I going to do? It's a contract and you've made your bed, now we're going to have to lie in it and we'll try and make it as soft as we can, but we can't necessarily fix it 100%. Okay, the real estate then gets its authority, I suppose, from the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act. And of course, in my notes, I've indicated a number of sections that we need to look at. Um, the first thing is, of course, when he's got a vendor and the vendor wants to sell his house and he contacts a real estate agent and says, okay, I want to sell my property, um, you know, what do I do next? The real estate agent then presents him with the brokerage contract or the listing agreement and says, well, you know, first thing we got to do is get you signed up here. And of course he wants to do that because he wants to be sure that he's going to get his commission. And that's where it all comes in because depending on the type of contract that we're dealing with, um, depends on what kind of a uh, commission that will be payable. Basically there's three types of listings. We have the exclusive listing. And I, in my practice, don't see that listing very often. In Toronto, it may be a different story, but primarily because, although it's an only, generally speaking, it's only a 5% commission to be paid, the, uh, the vendor has to know his agent pretty well because he's, in effect, giving that agent exclusive authority to sell that property under these terms and conditions. And the, the agent uh, may well be the kind of agent that all he wants to do is get a lot of listings and he doesn't want to do a lot of work and the property could just sit on the market for uh, Coon's age and of course you know the usual story after that is well gee you know we've gone in too high we've got to reduce the price and then we get into all that kind of thing. Um, the next of course and the most common is the multiple listing and of course the commission there is uh, usually six percent. Um, in that particular type of listing, of course, the vendor client, you know, generally benefits because, of course, it's a, a listing that a number of agents are involved and it just goes without saying that the more people that are involved, the more times the thing is talked about, the more likely it is that a sale will result. And uh, that's the kind we generally see. And, of course, we see MLS, which, of course, is the multiple listing service, short form trade symbols, but it's also they usually have it a photo MLS, which simply means they take pictures of the, the property and submit it to the book uh, that the agents use and, and away they go. Lastly, sorry, lastly we have the, <laughs> Miriam's mumbling away here, I don't know. She's listening, talking to herself. Lastly, we have um, the open listing. And of course in that case, 
uh, basically anybody can sell the property, including the vendor himself, and it's only the commission is only payable upon the actual culmination of the uh, of the sale. Um, in terms of listing agreement, of course, again referring to the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act, what you know, what are the elements of the listing agreement? Well, of course, it has to be in writing. It has to be by all the parties to be bound. An executed copy has to be given to the person actually signing the agreement. And of course, it must provide for an expiry date. And in my notes, I had referred to a case that uh, there was a renewal of the listing agreement. And it contained basically the same terms and conditions. Obviously, the only change was the expiry date. And that a copy was not given to the vendor. And of course, the court held that, uh, you know, invalid. It wasn't, uh, it had to be provided to the vendor even though it was substantially the same. So that, giving it to the person signing it is, is very, very important. Okay, um, I think that the rest of my notes in connection with the real estate agent are fairly self-explanatory and I don't think I'm going to really dwell any more time uh, in connection with them. I, I just like to say that obviously it's very, very important that the client be made to understand that the lawyer really does have a role to play. The real estate certainly has a role to play as well, but the lawyer has a role to play, and that the lawyer should be involved, you know, really early on, uh, certainly before any contract for sale has been signed, simply not because he wants to put a squash on the deal, but simply because he wants to be sure that the client knows what it is that he's bargaining for. Uh, from the purchaser's point of view, especially a first-time purchaser, it's very important because there are a lot of things in a builder's type of offer, for example, that the purchaser, it's just words to him, and he doesn't really understand what it is that he's contracting for. And I'll get into that when I get talking about costs because I have a particular newspaper article that appeared in the local paper in the area in which I practice that, you know, really caused a lot of stir simply because first time home buyers were going out to the site office, dealing with real estate agents on, on site, and they, in effect, were signing contracts and they really didn't know what it was that was that they were, they thought they were contracting to buy the, uh, a house for a set purchase price. Well, that was true, but there were a lot of, no, of other things in the contract that they were not made aware of, and it wasn't until just prior to closing that these things came to light when their lawyer kind of phoned them up and said, hey, we need this many dollars for closing, and the guy just about had cardiac arrest. And uh, so it's very, very important from a purchaser's point of view. From a vendor's point of view on a typical resale, it's very important also that he brings the offer in to let his solicitor review it because we, we know we've, we've seen instances where the offer provides that the vendor is to discharge all existing encumbrances at his own expense and he doesn't realize that he's got a closed mortgage and he has a particular mortgagee who, you know, just plain and simply may not accept payment, you know, even if he pays him three months uh, bonus on the mortgage and, you know, if we can avoid those kind of problems, let's do it. Um, Again, from my practice, I, I had a particular instance where a lady came in, and she was obviously under a lot of stress, and her husband had lost his job, and um, he was had, you know, going west, young man, to find the new world of opportunity, and um, left her with the house. They did a transfer over into her name, and left her with the house, and she was to stay behind and sell the property. And uh, when she sold the property, of course, she was then to join him out west with the family. And basically, you know, she was just all she could think of is get this place sold. And the real estate agent uh, brought her an offer and the uh, price was right and she was reasonably satisfied. And it said that the uh, purchaser was to um, assume the existing mortgage and, and so on. A standard kind of a thing. So she couldn't see any harm in it and she simply signed it. And then she came to me with the signed offer and said, well, I, I guess I need a lawyer. Uh, will you handle it? And I said, fine, and I didn't know the lady at all and didn't know anything about the, the house and so on. And as I started to go through the documentation, she fortunately had enough foresight to bring in her copy of the mortgage and so on. Here was right in the mortgage that immediately upon the sale of the property, the mortgage was due forthwith. And I, I sort of looked at that and I looked at her across the desk and I sort of said to her, well, um, did, what about this clause in the mortgage? And she had realized about that, but the agent told her there'd be no problem. I, the lawyer, could solve the problem. Fortunately, I, I guess I was Wonder Woman, I don't know, I managed to get it solved without a lot of trouble for her, but uh, I just sort of scratched my head and there's a, a prime example of the importance of bringing the, uh, the offer in to us ahead of time because, you know, 
perhaps I could have saved her a little bit of grief because when I re mentioned to her that I think we might have a bit of a problem here, she wasn't really in too good shape after that, and I felt, felt kind of badly. But what could I do? That's my job. I have to tell her the problems and solve them as best we can. Okay, moving on then to costs and adjustments. Um, and again, talking with the, the first time home buyer, this is where I'm going to refer to my lovely little article from the local paper, the heading of which says, Young home buyers hit with whopping $2,300 surprise. And that sounds like a fair bit of dollars. But when you look at the actual purchase price of the home, which was $64,990, that's, that's a fair chunk uh, of money that these people just were not prepared to, uh, to come up with. They basically thought that $64,990 was the purchase price. They paid $1,000 down. Uh, they were going to assume a mortgage for, I don't know, it doesn't say in the article, but say about $55,000 or something like that, and then they were going to come up with the, the balance. And, and that's, that's what they had counted on because nobody told them anything about adjustments. Nobody told them anything about the developer's agreement that says that um, hydro charges will be added and uh, water service charges will be added and, and mortgage uh, from the, the date of the, uh, of the closing to the interest adjustment date and that the vendor is going to estimate an amount uh, to be held towards mortgage interest and realty taxes and that will be added on. And that the HUDAC, $105, uh, will be collected by the vendor. I mean, all of this was in the offer, but it was only a trained eye that could actually see it. And of course, these people didn't have the trained eye. They just saw the figures and said, great, so they went ahead. And in the article here, uh, they have things, you know, lovely captions like, he was stunned, meaning the, the male client. Three days before we were supposed to move in, our lawyer phoned and told us how much we'd have to pay. I couldn't believe it. I was stunned. There went the washer and the dryer, for example, that they were planning on using that money to buy those things. And a breakdown of the additional costs includes $175 for the water meter charge, $165 for the hydro connection charge, interest on the first mortgage for $638, $105 for HUDAC, and so on. I, uh, had, I didn't have this particular set of clients, but I know the development well because I've done a number of purchases in the area, and as soon as the offers come in to me the first time, that's the first thing I do is go through it, and I have a very good idea as to the exact dollar figure that we're talking about, uh, and I can tell my clients ahead of time. And subsequently, when I've had clients bring the offer in before they sign, I tell them these things. And generally speaking, you know, they still buy the house. They think it's fine, as long as they knew what they were contracting for. And I think that was the big problem here. As the article says, unexpected closing costs. And I mean, if someone knew, they could budget for it and so on. In any event, apparently the sales people at the site had not given any indication. To, and and I, you notice I never mentioned land transfer tax or disbursements or lawyers' fees or anything like that. I, you know, what I was enumerating there was simply the adjustments. But uh, I think uh, what happened was the people on site that were selling the houses were just so interested in selling the houses, they didn't really bother going into the details. And uh, as a result, the uh, purchasers were unaware. But I guess after this article came out, it said here, a couple of these reporters from this newspaper went out and acted as a house hunting couple. And geez, the, the salesman on site just gave full disclosure right down the line. So maybe it is important that you know, these kind of things come out. I'll leave the article up here if anybody wants to look at it at half time or whatever, they're welcome to do so. Okay, going ahead with costs and adjustments then, I'm going to turn now to the workbook. And I'm particularly addressing my uh, comments here on pages uh, 26 and 27, obviously. I have um, taken the example, um, I think we've give, been given two fact situations, the, um, the rural one and the urban one. And I believe I took the urban one because it dealt with a purchase in Brampton, so I felt it kind of touched, touched my heart. Yeah, thank you, Mar Miriam. Page six. That's the one where we had a $165,000 purchase. I don't see too many of those in Brampton. I know they're there, but I don't see them. I'm more inclined to be doing the 64,990. But in any event, deposit of $10,000, assumption of an existing mortgage of uh, approximately $90,000 with interest at 12% and a deposit of $10,000. And a second mortgage back, sorry, I think I worked that out to uh, 41,000. 
my mathematics is correct. In any event, looking to page 26 then, where we're speaking about the deposit. First thing we have there is cost of deposit. Well, in this case, we have a substantial deposit. We have $10,000. And in our fact situation, it really wasn't uh, set out exactly when the offer was submitted, but presume it was submitted today, February the 4th. Uh, according to our amendments to our fact situation, we have a closing of March the 17th. So in effect, we have our $10,000 tied up for 41 days. And of course, if we put that $10,000 into a daily interest account, I had this checked out today and the amount escapes me, but say it's 14%, maybe that's a bit high. In any event, you can readily see that if we could get that kind of interest over a period of 41 days, I mean, why shouldn't we have it as opposed, we being the purchaser, as opposed to the real estate who simply you know, in accordance with the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act, they have to have a trust account, and of course they deposit the money to their trust account. So that's the first thing to look at. The next thing to look at here is the provincial and municipal expenses. Incidentally, apparently there are some lawyers who, who use this uh, schedule of costs to uh, discuss with their client during the initial interview of the kind of costs that they can look at, and I gather that the poor, I, I personally don't set it out as clearly as this. I do discuss things with them, but I don't go through as many things here. And I'm told that the clients tend to walk out of the office rather white knuckled and shaking and wondering whether they really should go through with this purchase simply because of the amount of money. You will appreciate here that this particular uh, example that we're using, we're trying to look at every conceivable cost. And I hope to goodness there's not a real estate deal around that every one of these costs comes into play. But nonetheless, the object of the exercise is to, to look at our fact situation, apply the costs as we can, and of course, just generally make comments with respect to the other costs that may or may not apply at this particular time. Well, under provincial and municipal expenses, of course, we've got our taxes, and the province of Ontario comes out the big winner because, of course, the first thing is the land transfer tax, and we know that in April of 79, I believe, it went up to what is it? I always just do the multiplying over 45,000. I multiply by eight and subtract 180. In our particular fact situation here, $165,000 purchase price, we are looking at, I believe, $1,140 for land transfer tax alone. The other interesting point there to draw to your attention is what if we have a non resident purchaser dealing specifically with the land transfer tax aspects? The Land Transfer Tax Act, of course, provides that these people really get it in the ear. They have to pay under Section 2.2, they have to pay 20% of the value of the consideration for the conveyance. In this case, we'd be looking at, on our $165,000 example, we'd be looking at $33,000, which is, uh, that, would be making, uh, that would make anyone think twice about doing the purchase. But in, in fairness, uh, when I was looking up this uh, facts and figures in the Land Transfer Tax Act, I also went on to look that there's a deferral section or remission on tax on certain conveyances to non-resident, and that's provided for in Section 16 of the Act. And there you'll find that I think in many instances a non-resident person can, by falling into either this uh, uh, not an unrestricted land or falling into the category of, of being exempt. I think in 16 sub 4, it talks about reduction of tax in certain cases. Well, what actually happens if you have someone who is being lawfully admitted to Canada and they want to establish their principal residence and they want to work here um, and that they, they swear an affidavit as to all of those facts, including the fact that he's not in Canada as a tourist or a visitor, then basically he pays the same land transfer tax that you and I do. So he doesn't really get nailed with the $33,000 figure that I gave you in our example. But anyway, there were several pages in the Land Transfer Tax Act that discussed this in detail. And suffice it to say that I think that in most cases, there are deferrals and so on, and uh, the people can get exempted from paying that tax. Okay, next thing we have, of course, is the retail sales tax. Be surprised about the number of people that don't realize that they really are supposed to, you know, for their vendor, they're supposed to collect and submit to the province, and if they're a purchaser, they're supposed to pay sales tax at the rate of 7% on chattels. <clears throat> As I understand it, with our mini budget right now, the um, people buying from a developer, if, if they're buying appliances, 
and those appliances have recently been acquired, then they will not have to pay tax because they are exempt. But that's something that comes and goes. And so suffice it to say that if they're buying, pretend it's not presently, but if they're buying, say, $2,500 for our, the purpose of our example here, worth of chattels, they would then pay $175 additional retail sales tax. Okay, the next thing we have is the out-of-pocket expenses. And of course, we all know about how those are just getting absolutely out of hand. And recently, certainly the sheriff's execution certif uh, certificate searches um, caused untold grief because we were running into 30 and $40 just for sheriff's executions alone. And fortunately, that uh, regulation has been reversed and we're back to the situation where we can get 15 names pr providing there are no executions. We can search 15 names for the uh, $6 fee and, and that, of course, saves our clients a fair bit of money. In any event, if uh, you notice your land registrar title record examination, well, of course, that's the old, you know, doing your search and pulling all of the instruments and so on. And as I tell clients when they come in, you know, I don't know anything about this title right now, and I don't know how much we're going to be looking at, but let's say $25 for the sake of argument. Registrations, of course, we know if we're in the registry office, it's simply $15 to register your, your deed or your mortgage, um, $2 for every extra lot. If you're in uh, land titles, you're right off the bat 15 plus, then you've got your dollar per name for the executions, and generally it's about, and again, the same $2 per lot applies, so we're generally at least $17 uh, to register a document. This next one, judgment clearances, kind of threw me a bit when I first looked at it because I was immediately thinking the sheriff's execution and so on. But then when I thought about it, I realized, no, that wasn't what we were referring to here. Um, and in fact, I had a personal experience with that very thing. What had happened was I had the misfortune of having a client whose name was Smith. And um, fortunately, though, the land was not in land titles because had it been, I would have been in a real jackpot. But uh, the lawyer with whom I was dealing, he decided that why should he be any different than the land registrar? And he wanted all of the things that the land registrar would have wanted if the land had been in land titles. So he made me go through the, the hoops. And basically what happened was um, we discovered, sure, and, you know, of course, obviously there was an execution. And at that time, the, the limit was $2,500. I understand now it's 5000 But in any event, it was a $3,300 execution or something. And I had to get on the bandwagon to... Uh, to get a clearance, and I ended up, it was, a, it was a bank that had it, and I ended up by having to deal with a, uh, a solicitor who wanted to cover himself three ways to Sunday, and I can't really blame the fellow, but I was just going to get down to the point where I just wasn't going to be able to close my deal, because not only did he want from me a $50 fee for, for giving me the necessary letter that I needed to say that my man wasn't the guy that they had sued, he also wanted uh, a declaration from my client in detail setting out you know, his history since the date he was born and all the wives that he had had and places that he had lived and so on, unequivocally saying, stating that you know, he isn't the fellow that they, they sued. And the, the thing that broke, broke the, straw, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back was he wanted my firm to indemnify him and save him harmless should he have made a mistake. And I said, I want my man's deal to close, but not that badly. So fortunately, I was dealing with a reasonable fellow on the other side. And, I told him I'd done everything I could, but that was the last stroke. And again, as I said, it wasn't in a land title, so we were able to close the deal. But uh, it's almost the point where you think, what's your name? Smith, thank you. Would you like to see somebody down the street? Don't want to act for you, because it's, uh, it's a lot of trouble. But anyway, we're looking at a minimum of $50, plus all the extra time you're going to have to spend and the extra approaches you're going to have to make. OK, municipal tax and water arrear certificates. I just threw in $10 there for the sake of argument. In Brampton, they charge $5, but uh, some other jurisdictions charge more, so wherever you are. Other searches, I think what we mean here is things like uh, your right to the municipality for clearance with respect to a subdivision agreement. And again, you're looking at uh, you know $10 per agreement kind of thing out where we are. And I know in Toronto and some of the boroughs, it's a, it's a heck of a lot more than that. So we just threw in a nice $100 figure to go along with that. Miscellaneous, and you see we have long distance charges, courier charges, and so on. I mean, the fact that you get a deal in this Friday and it's closing next Friday, I mean, that's all too common as far as I can see, and couriers are becoming more and more significant in the practice of law. And certainly if you want next day service, you're looking at $6.45 from Brampton to Toronto. And uh, so I threw in there a nice round figure of $25 to cover those off. 
Next, uh, we're looking at surveys. And we all know how important those are, and I'm not going to get into too much difficulty here. I think I just hold back on my, what comments I might have made, because Lorraine's going to be talking about that in the second hour, and she's far more knowledgeable in the area of surveys than I am. So suffice it to say that um, we can look at additional costs, and I think a plot plan sketch here of survey, you know, a, a residential uh, lot on a plan, I don't think $500 would go. Uh, would be a insignificant figure there. I think that'd probably be fairly significant. Surveyor certificate, of course, I don't know how too many surveyors around that are prepared to give those because really they're sticking their neck on the line, but you may be looking at a $250 figure there. Monumentation, if you want them to go out and find your markers and stick them in the ground, we could be looking at $50 to $100. Again, these are just, you know, Lorraine can set us straight if I'm really off on these, but. I understand them to be fairly accurate. The physical building survey, I kind of wondered what that was when I saw that. I think what we're talking about there are these um, home evaluator type services that they'll go out and they'll look at the actual building on the property and they will say things like, mm, the roof's going to cave in in six months' time or uh, you've got termites in the basement or whatever. And um, those people have a sort of a set fee, and I think in my lecture I had set out that basically the minimum fee is $150,000, or sorry, $150 for $50,000 purchase, and it goes up accordingly. So I put $150 minimum into that. And then we're into the uh, game of insurance next for fire and extended perils, and of course that's all we as solicitors are really interested in. The mortgagee wants to have his himself protected, and uh, he's only interested in fire coverage, and. Uh, Likewise, if you're acting for a vendor, selling and he's taking a mortgage back, well, of course, he's a mortgagee in that case. It's the same kind of thing. A lot of clients think that we should be concerned about contents and so on, and I have a great time telling them that's your concern. All I want to do is make sure we've got fire coverage for the mortgagee. In any event, assumption of vendor's prepaid insurance premium, well, that sort of has almost disappeared from adjustments with the exception of uh, buying from a uh, developer uh, simply because... Um, you know, most of us know that the game of transferring insurance is not a fun one anymore. They won't let us do it for the most part. Uh, basically, what happens there is, uh, notwithstanding the offer to purchase, that sort of presumes that the purchaser will assume the vendor's policy. Uh, most vendors don't transfer. Of course, purchasers then are instructed to arrange their own foreclosing. And uh, so, I, I, although I have a $100 figure thrown down here, I'm thinking more in the terms of buying from a developer and he's already got enough, like on, in our example, a $90,000 uh, mortgage, and that's what we're interested in covering. Uh, I phoned up an agent in town, and he was sort of saying, well, $214 would be a reasonable uh, cost for insurance to cover a $90,000 mortgage. Um, and then that, of course, I've jumped ahead here into the next one, which is the, the new policy and what kind of coverage we're looking at for our first mortgage. And I noticed I didn't really deal with a vendor uh, take back in our example, which I should have, because obviously the increase. But that brings something else I just should mention at this point, and I'm sure we all know it, but I'll just recite it again. And that is that if in our example, we've got a $165,000 purchase, we've got a $90,000 mortgage being assumed, and we have a mortgage back for, I, I forget, I think, I think I said 40,000 or something of that nature. That brings us up to, 130000 on a $165,000 purchase, and a lot of mortgagees insist on having full coverage for 130000 but we all know that if the property burns down, the man is not going to be able to collect 130000 He may get only 120000 or something like that, and some mortgagees are, are fairly uh, good-hearted in that if you explain that to them, they understand, and they say, okay, just get us the full insurable value, and we'll be satisfied with that. And I always like to see that kind of an approach because I think it's really rotten that somebody has to pay insurance premiums on something that they're just not going to be able to collect on. So anyway, that's a consideration. Um, life and health policy there. What we're talking about there is the mortgagor's life insurance. And a lot of uh, approved lenders, institutional lenders, uh, offer that to the mortgagor at the time they're taking out the mortgage loan. They say, well, now, if you die, uh, what's going to happen? Wouldn't you like to have that loan life insured? Or maybe they even make it a requirement. In any event, um, 
we could be, you know, looking at, uh, I don't know, another 10 or $11 a month added on to the mortgage payments uh, in order to cover the mortgage or for uh, life insurance. Okay, then moving down into um, number five, which is the adjustments with the vendor. And again, looking at the first heading there, the existing mortgage, I think looking at our example, uh, we talked about the offer saying that it was approximately $90,000, uh, the mortgage that we were assuming. When we actually looked at the amortization schedule uh, with respect to our particular transaction, which can be found on page 83 of the workbook. Which I haven't got yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Miriam says you don't have that yet, so you'll have to just trust me. It says that after the March 6, 1981 payment of 928.71 was made, the outstanding balance is 89,795.35. Well, again, the first consideration here, of course, is the purchaser had contracted to assume a, a mortgage of 90,000, and it's now actually less than that. So that amounts to uh, what did I say? 100? Is it 205 dollars approximately? Okay, that extra, of course, that if he doesn't get it in terms of the mortgage, he then has to come up with that in cash uh, in order to uh, still come back to the same purchase price. So that's uh, one consideration. Um, the other, of course, is in connection with the actual um, interest because, as I mentioned, uh, our payments, I think in our example it said something about uh, payments on the first of the month but maturing on the 6th of April or something. I saw that as a little bit of a pitfall. I presume what we meant there was, uh, you know, the 6th of the month are the payments and the 6th is the maturity date. So assuming the vendor makes the March the 6th, 1981 payment, thereby reducing the principal down to that figure that I quoted earlier, then there's the matter of the, the credit. I guess the purchaser, in effect, gets some of the money back because that uh, accrued interest, of course, will serve as a credit to the purchaser on the adjustments, and that will counterbalance against the shortfall in the mortgage. And on, there's two ways of calculating that. And I'm no mathematician, so I always get confused in this area, but looking at the amortization schedule, if we look at the um, breakdown as to principal and interest for that particular payment, we're looking at interest of 876.80, and if we f divide that by 31, we get our daily rate, and times the number of days, which in this example would be March 6th to the 17th. So we came out with uh, $311.12 credit to the purchaser. But if we just took the straight 89,795.35 being the balance outstanding times the 12% and dividing that by the number of days in the year and getting your daily rate, it actually works out to a bit more, 324.72. In any event, counterbalance that with a shortfall of the 205, and in this case our purchaser is, is in a winning situation because he, uh, in effect, doesn't have to come up with all that extra cash. Okay, prepaid insurance premiums, well, we've already talked about that above in 4A and chattels and additions to premises. We've already talked about that in 2A. 2A little 2, I guess it is. Um, realty taxes and local improvements. It's a little hard to sort of speculate what the realty taxes would be, but I, I took for my example, I looked at a deal I did in Scarborough, and uh, for 1980 on 165000 it was $1,542 and change, and I inflated that to allow for 81. Uh, approximately 10%. So I came up with a tax figure of 1696.62, and I did my calculation and so on. And I assumed that by the time March 17th rolled around, the vendor would have made at least the first installment towards taxes. Presumably, he made it the end of February, but I figured he still would have been short. And so the purchaser then ends up with a credit. And in my example, I gave him $68.27. Fuel oil. Well, these days, it seems to me most of the deals that I'm dealing with are. Uh, meters to be read for closing, so there isn't any adjustment, but the last one I did, I think, was in the fall, late fall, and I believe it was 92 cents a gallon. So as you can see, at 200 gallons, and we're looking at another approximately $190 in adjustment there. And other matters for utilities and water heater, rental, and so on, well, again, that's kind of a nickel and dime situation. If you're renting your, your water tank or something like that, then it's a small service charge that we have to pay to the gas company or whoever. Okay, going along then on to the mortgage financing, the existing mortgage, well, as I mentioned to you, there was a bit of a foul up in that it was supposed to be 90,000 and it's actually 89.7 and change. So there's a shortfall there. Accrued interest, I discussed that with you. It depends on 
well, and in every case, it would be a case if the vendor had paid his mortgage up to the last payment date, and that is in our example, March the 6th to the 17th, the purchaser's gonna end up in a credit situation. Realty tax account, this can be a real shocker to a lot of purchasers because, you know, in, in some instances, the vendor has been really building up quite a credit, and uh, come, come time for the sale to come along, uh, he's obviously going to look for compensation by the purchaser for that credit because the purchaser just assumes it, and that could well end up by being a couple hundred dollars, depending on the time of the year and, and so on. Monthly life insurance premium, well, I discussed that already, and I threw an $11 per month figure for that. Mortgage status statement, that uh, some people do charge, and I threw in $25 there for getting a statement as to what the status of the mortgage is. And funny thing, if you get an amortization schedule for your client and then you get a statement from the mortgagee, they never seem to match up. I don't know what it is, but they never seem to match up. So clients often get a little worried about that. And um, under new mortgage, well, this is where the poor purchaser really gets it in the ear because there's all kinds of costs here that come into play. And a lot of them just don't well, they just don't have any way of knowing ahead of time, and they're really shocked when you start getting down to the short strokes with them. First thing, if they don't go and see their friendly bank manager themselves, but they go and they let the real estate go and find them a mortgage, well, then, of course, there's going to be the brokerage fee and the finder's fee, and you're looking, you could be looking at $450 for the one and $150 for the other. The application, well, I, I was talking to the Mortgage Insurance Corporation of Canada today, and the, their application fee is, is $35, so I think a lot of them are $35, so I'll throw that in. The appraisal and inspection fee, well, again, it, it, I think it's around $100. Some of them are 85, some of them are 100 and a quarter, but just for the sake of argument, I put in fifth, uh, 100. The investigation and credit report, I mean, the people want to know whom they're dealing with, so they go and get this kind of Dun & Bradstreet type of a report, and you're looking at about $50 there. Then the deductions from the loan proceeds, that's where the purchaser really gets unhappy because he goes out and gets himself a $90,000 mortgage and he thinks he's going to get $90,000, but he really doesn't because of all of these things come off the top and he ends up with something considerably less and that of course means he has to dig into his pocket and come up with a difference because he budgets himself for the 90000 as opposed to something less. If I get involved at that stage, when they're making the application for the new loan, I kind of try and tell them a lot of these things so that they'll know that this is going to come off the top and uh, you'll be in a position then to you know, better advise your clients so that presumably at the end they'll, they'll have the money. <clears throat> mortgage insurance fee, well, as I mentioned, the um, Mortgage Insurance Company of Canada, they say it's 1.5% of the mortgage which I thought was rather strange because in a lot of the deals I'm seeing, they must have a sliding scale going down because uh, I've seen a lot of deals in the $65,000 area where the mortgage is uh, 50000 and uh, they don't charge 750 for their fee or whatever. It's, it's something less than the $500 figure. The future realty tax account, well, some mortgagees, of course, want to build up some equity there so that they can look to it when they have to start making the installments. And so they may well just add on a front end load and say, fine, we're going to deduct two or three hundred dollars off of the net proceeds and we're going to put that away for the mortgagee's realty tax account. Interest to the interest adjustment date. Okay, there, uh, of course, if we're advancing on the 17th of March, they'll probably say that the interest adjustment date will be the 1st of April and, of course, the first regular payment will then be the 1st of May, and then they have to deduct the interest on the full amount of the mortgage from the 17th of March to the 1st of April, and, and that could run into a fairly substantial amount of dollars as well. And then again, they may insist upon the life insurance premium and so on. And again, we'd already talked about that up above as to what kind of costs we could be looking at. Uh, other holdbacks for repairs and liens and things like that, again, it doesn't happen all that often. Most of these things we run into on a regular basis. That one, of course, is if you're buying kind of a dilapidated place, they may say, well, we're going to hold back a couple of thousand dollars until you get the, the, those things completed in the house. And then when you have, you can come and get your final advance. Um, just while I'm thinking, I don't think it really ties in there, but just while I'm thinking about other deductions from mortgages and things like that, um, I was thinking about the holdback when you're buying from a developer 
and uh, you're assuming a mortgage, or, you know, they say you're assuming, but it's really a new one, and say it's the 90000 that we're talking about, and it's a building mortgage, and maybe by the time your man moves in, they've only advanced $80,000, and there's a whole back of $10,000. And again, in the uh, developer's offer to purchase, he provides that the purchaser will be paying interest to him on the full amount of the mortgage, notwithstanding the fact that not all of it has been advanced. And of course, that makes sense, because his contract is that, you know, there is a $90,000 mortgage, and uh, if it happens to be less than that, well, he's still giving the purchaser the credit on the adjustments for the full 90000 But that's another cost to the purchaser because, as I see it anyway, the guy that really wins is the, um, is the mortgagee because he is collecting in from the purchaser based on the full 90000 being advanced, but he hasn't quite paid out the full 90000 He's still holding some monies back, and the vendor ends up in the proper position. The purchaser ends up by sort of paying twice, so to speak, and the mortgagee ends up by collecting. But that's another uh, matter of, I just thought of it now when we were talking about mortgages, so I thought I'd throw it in. Other expenses, well, we've already talked about survey expenses, and I've given you an example about fire insurance. Out-of-pocket expenses, we're talking there about um, moving company costs. Uh, storage costs, uh, you want your utilities hooked up, you have to pay a changeover fee to the hydro and so on. In connection with the moving uh, costs, I know it seems to me anyway that most of the moving companies I'm hearing about want their money up front and the poor purchaser on the day of closing, he's got to run around with a couple of thousand dollars in his pocket, either that or a certified check, because it's the story where they're not going to uh, do a darn thing till they see the color of your money and I think that causes, certainly on a day of moving, it gets pretty confusing for purchasers and vendors, and to have to have that kind of money right handy, it's uh, kind of bad. Okay, then we've got, uh, I'm skipping over the lawyer's fee for a moment, because that comes in a little later on. Amortization schedule, well, that's the best bargain in town, because we can get that for 250 Then on the vendor mortgage back, again, he may well want an investigation or a credit report, and we talked about that already as being around $50. Fire insurance, of course, the purchaser has to carry enough insurance to cover the mortgage back. Uh, re reduced out-of-pocket expenses. I don't know what we're talking about there. Amortization schedule, of course, we discussed that already. And, of course, we have the lawyer's fee. One thing I'd throw in there is if the vendor, cost of the vendor, in the event that he takes a mortgage back and he really needs all of the money for his actual his next purchase. He then has to sell the mortgage back. And when he does that, of course, he never comes out in the same position he would have been because it costs some money to sell the mortgage back. And he gets almost into the position of being a purchaser arranging a new mortgage because he then has to satisfy the purchaser of the mortgage about survey requirements. And if he doesn't have one, that causes him some grief. He also has to pay the legal fees, the lawyer acting for the, um, the ultimate mortgagee. He has to pay search fees, uh, ensure that the insurance is, is okay, uh, and so on. So uh, not to mention, of course, the most important uh, uh, deduction, and that is, of course, the discount. Because clearly, if you're going to take a mortgage back for $40,000 at 10% or something, and you want to sell it right away and get your money, well, then somebody's going to offer to buy that from you, but they're not going to give you 40000 for it. It's going to be something less than that, and they have a sliding scale that they apply just to how much money it'll actually be. And uh, I had a kind of a cute story. An elderly couple came in, they had sold their property, and um, they were pretty sharp because the real estate, uh, the real estate sort of, I get the feeling he's coming out as a bad guy on all of this. I don't really quite mean it to sound that way, but it just sort of happens. But there have been a few choice incidents where he has been the bad guy, and this was a cute one because the old uh, gentleman and lady uh, wanted this, you know, they had signed a listing agreement and they said they wanted all cash and that uh, their property was free and clear of encumbrance and so on. And the agent brought them this offer, and it was, uh, you know, mortgage back. And they said, well, we don't want a mortgage back. We want all our money. Well, the agent took them aside and told them, don't, don't, don't worry about the mortgage back. I mean, you know, we'll sell it for you, and you'll end up with all your cash. You'll be in the same position. And they said, well, yeah, but, it, but how much is it going to cost? So, well, don't worry about that. We'll look after all of that. And, and, you know, we'll sell it for sure because we have somebody waiting in the wings right now. And they said, well, why don't you just get him to take the mortgage himself and never mind me? And so they did save them. And I was really thrilled to hear that because most people forget it. <laughs> they, they get talked into these things and, and it's the old story where they're signing the offer at 11 o'clock at night and the agent's telling them that the people are sitting in the car and if they don't sign now they're not going to get their household and all that kind of thing. But anyway, these people were really sharp and they ended up out on the wi winning side because of course it didn't cost them anything and they got what they wanted and the 
the mortgage was, you know, the people arranged their own mortgage directly with this mortgagee. The only difference was he didn't get the benefit of the discount. Last but not least, of course, is the lawyer's fees. And uh, we left that right to the end because we want the client to see that there are all these other people who have got their hand out, and we're the good guys because we're doing all this work. And at the very, very end, we didn't, in a matter of our fees, it's just sort of something sort of slip along. Um, in, um, in Toronto, I forget what you, there is a tariff, a suggested fee schedule, pardon me, don't let me use the word tariff. Um, and uh, it used to be, I think, one and a quarter percent on a purchase and three quarters of one percent on a sale. And I don't think there's a person alive that still charges that or can get it. Uh, in Brampton, uh, we have a, the Law Association, of course, has a schedule of fees. And I don't know of anybody that charges that either. It's just you just can't get it. Uh, we are, I suppose, the largest firm in town. And um, we try to stick to a fairly substantial fee because we're inclined to agree with the Law Society's uh, ruling that you know, if you charge an inferior fee, almost certainly inferior work will result. And so we, we don't get a lot of these people. They, we get a lot of calls, people shopping around, but we're just not prepared to do the $100,000 deal for $250, and so they always find themselves somewhere else. There, there are, every now and again, uh, it's really reassuring to have people call and say, well, we've called four or five other lawyers, and you know, their fees are all lower, lower than yours. But I don't know whether I did a good sales pitch on the phone or what, but they decided to come to me anyways. So it's kind of nice to know. In any event, and of course we're entitled to fees if we're doing, if there's a new mortgage being placed, obviously we have to certify to a mortgagee in addition to a purchaser, and that has to be an additional fee, and the suggested fee schedule does allow for more uh, on that. Okay, um, I don't think I've left anything out as far as uh, going through those are concerned. Let me just take a quick moment here. I seem to have uh, wait, going along. I just want to very quickly go through availability and met uh, methods of financing. And if I can just, in my notes, I've got a, a, a lot about private financing, banks and trust company, NHA uh, financing and so on. And they're all pretty well set out there. So I'm not going to spend any more time on those. One thing I didn't talk about, and I did when I was talking about the costs here, and that's the Mortgage Insurance Company of Canada. Um, and of course, certainly in Peel, as a result of that, uh, type of insurance, um, the Canadian government is now in, in the position of owning quite a few condominium units in the Peel area. And uh, basically, that uh, company was established by an Act of Parliament in 1963, and it provides the mortgagee with substantial protection against defaulting mortgagors. It's just an insurance policy that the first mortgagee is entitled to, and if they don't, uh, the mortgagor defaults, then they can go ahead and uh, uh, make a claim on the, uh, against the Mortgage Insurance Company of Canada or through their insurance policy and, and be paid, and that's exactly what's happening. Uh, their fee is, as I mentioned earlier, 1.5% of the face amount of the mortgage, and it's simply added to the mortgage. And in addition, we have a $35 uh, application fee as well. Um, again, moving ahead quickly here, practical pointers. I had gone into quite a bit about the home and inspection services, the HUDAC, and so on. Again, it's all in my notes, so I don't think I'll really uh, dwell on that. What I would like to do is just kind of finish up with a bit about communications. And uh, again, looking to the workbook, on pages 22 and 23, we have uh, preliminary letters to the, both the vendor. Uh, sorry, do they have these? Yeah, they have these. Good. The preliminary letter to the vendor and the purchaser, and there they Looking at the vendor, it it's pretty well sets out the fact that we're acting for you and so on and the kind of information that we need in order to complete the transaction and the kind of things that the lawyer is looking for the actual vendor to do. Contact the utility companies and tell them that they're closing on such and such a date and where they can be located to, to uh, forward future bills and that kind of thing. So that's, that's a very good letter, I think. It's not quite the one that I use, but uh, rest assured I'll be looking to that for my precedence for future. With respect to the purchaser's letter, this, the one addition that I'd like to add there is the one that I think Alan Marshall from the Practice Advisory Service spoke last week, I believe, very briefly. Um, and one point that he raised that I think is a very good one, and that is if your client has told you over the telephone how he wishes to take title to the property, here's a good place to confirm to him his instructions as to how he wishes to take title and say to him now, you know, invite comments with respect to that uh, in the event that the purchaser 
subsequently changes his mind, or maybe he says, oh, well, I didn't tell you joint tenants, I said in my name alone or whatever. Well, here you've got a written record going out, and you're inviting his comments with respect to that confirmation. So I think it's a good idea to do that. Um, looking again in the workbook on pages uh, 20, 28, uh, that's a client's confirmation of instructions. Um, I have an example right now to use that. Um, I'm acting for a client that's buying a condominium and it's not registered or anything and I had uh, taken the builder's offer and kind of did a lot of changes to it and um, prepared it with a covering letter to the client and gave it to him. The client called me up yesterday and said, well, he wants to change the deposit to 10000 from 1000 and uh, I think that's okay, so I think I'll go ahead with that and so on. That's the kind of case where I think it'd be smart on my part to confirm that to him, that indeed he had changed the particular offer that I had prepared. He had changed it to a higher amount and he'd agreed to that because as it turns out, that money's going to be tied up for about eight months and he's going to and I explained to him about the interest as provided for in the condominium act and so on but I, I think it's a good idea to confirm his instructions that he is going to make that kind of a change in the offer the other uh, conflict of interest letter is a good one on page 29 our firm uses one very very similar to that the only thing is that we do is we just simply say as required by the law society we wish to advise that we're acting on both sides in the business about confidentiality of information and how if there's a conflict that uh, we can't act for either and we have to send them both away. So that's a good letter to use. And just a comment, again, tying in with communications on page 30 about the memorandum to conveyancer. That particular form, again, is very similar to one we use. I have a personal beef with respect to advising the conveyancer the exact date when the requisitions are due because more often than not, that's the date I get the search back and it sure as heck's no good to me on that day if I happen to be coming downtown to give a lecture for the Law Society and I don't have time to review the search and get my letter out. So I tend to fudge that date a little bit and um, that poses a little bit of a problem if you can attach a copy of the offer because anybody can then check it. But uh, but in any event, some people just tend to rely on that, and that's the date that they uh, produce the requisition. So it's, I think it'd be more useful to have, you know, kind of date required, and then advance that a few days above, and then maybe if you want to tell them the date the requisitions are due. So the idea, of course, is to get it back a few days in advance of when they're actually due. That's presuming, of course, that you've got more than one week to do the deal. As uh, more often than not, it happens that everything, you know, gels at the last minute, the offer comes in. So, and one thing that we really have to do, too, is uh, in terms of communications, impress upon our client the significance of getting the offer to us as soon as the darn thing's been signed. I've had more clients hanging on to them. They think they're a Canada Savings Bond or something, and they're going to get interest on them if they hang on to them. And they sit there, and they hold on to it, and then suddenly, a week before closing, this thing trickles through the door, and then I've got to work like a son of a gun because I haven't been aware of the fact that they're even thinking of selling their property or whatever. So the, if I can just put a little plug in for the real property, the first question I had for Miriam tonight is, well, how are we going to get all this information to the client? Because that's what we've been talking about all evening. And uh, the way we're going to do it is the real property uh, branch of the Canadian Bar has uh, allocated some of our research fund towards preparing booklets for clients. And uh, I think that's basically what we're going to be doing is producing these, and also for lawyers as well, but have them available so they will go out to the clients and they will therefore realize the kind of things that they're supposed to be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. I didn't tell you in the introduction that at one time Brenda was one of my students. I uh, hope we both did well. We're going to have a two-second break. We'll stand up and change speakers. <laughs>